Jordan, I am so glad to finally have you on the show. How are you, my brother? I'm great, man. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I apologize. I had to reschedule a while ago. So thank you for being uh, very uh, flexible with my schedule. I appreciate that a lot. Dude, you are well worth the wait. I got so many things that I want to talk to you about. I mean, you're a dad. You're, oh, here's the here's thing that I didn't talk about during our little brief warm up before you got on. So I saw where you were just out in Austin with Tim Kennedy. Mm, yeah. And I just had Matt Bodro, his business partner, on the show a couple of weeks ago. Nice. And yeah. So it's so weird. You know, this is the best part of having this podcast is it shrinks the world so in such a crazy way, like, uh, okay, this is really wild. So I am looking through Instagram at one of my buddies, uh, posts from the A&M Alabama game. Okay. And I see the, and, and there's a Ted Cruz and somebody else doing a, a press conference. And I look at the back of the head of one of the reporters and I'm like, I think that's John Talty's head. Who's been on my show. He wrote a book about Nick Saban and he's a reporter in Birming Birmingham. And so I send him a text that said, Talty, is that your head? And he's like, <laughs> wow, way to spot that. And I said, yeah. So I saw you're sitting there doing a press conference with Ted Cruz, who's a friend of mine. And he said, oh my gosh, I'm trying to connect with him on this book I'm doing on NIL. And so, and, and all because John had been on this podcast. So it's just, dude, it's so weird. So I'm so, and, and also, it's also the reason why we met because we were out at the Dave Ramsey event. Yep. Yep. And I got to tell you, dude. I'm sitting there in, uh, in John Deloney's office with you, and you had every reason to be there, brother. You're successful. You have like hundreds of thousands of millions of, of, of followers that listen to you for fitness advice and nutritional advice and, and everything you've done. I don't know why I was there, but I'm sure glad I was because I got to meet, meet people like you. <laughs> that, that was a very fun event. They did a great job, and I'm really glad and blessed that we got to hang out and get to know each other. I'm excited to continue to grow our relationship as well. Well, here's what I want to start on with this today, Jordan. So, dude, you've got, you're so multifaceted, like I said before. I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of followers. Your, um, your, your YouTube channel is ridiculously successful. Uh, and you happen to be incredibly good at what you do, which is uh, a trainer. You're, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're honed in on nutrition, fitness, which were, you know, things I told you I love to geek out on. But before we even get into some of the amazing advice and wisdom that I know that you're going to be able to share with this audience, just kind of tell me where the Jordan Syatt story begins. How do you go from wherever you were to then for three freaking years being the personal trainer of Gary Vaynerchuk, which I can't imagine what kind of an adventure that must have been. I'm sure you got very low. Whatever rules you have about getting good quality sleep had to have been out the window. So, so kind of where does the story begin, Jordan? Yeah, so the, the story begins, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, or outside, I grew up in a suburb of Massachusetts, and um, basically my whole family is like very short, you know, you met me, I'm a short dude, I'm like five foot four on a good day, and we're Jewish, and so my mom was very concerned that my brother and I, two small Jewish guys, were going to get picked on in school, so she tells us one day she walks in the living room. She says, I'm putting you two into, uh, into wrestling. And I remember I, 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 the only wrestling that I knew was WWE style wrestling. And so I remember I looked at her and I was like, you want me to hit someone with a chair? And she was <laughs> like, no, you idiot, like Olympic style wrestling. And I didn't know what that was, but you know, I did it and I was eight years old at the time. And, um, and so she put us into wrestling and I, I fell in love with it. And, I was terrible in school. Like everyone else in my family is like doctors and lawyers and professors and superintendents and super, super, super like historians, very smart people. And I was, I was the black sheep of the family. I was in special education. I, I hated school, uh, but I loved wrestling and I loved, I loved everything body and health and fitness related. So at eight years old, I get into wrestling, I get obsessed with it. By the time I make it to high school uh, as a freshman, 14 years old, I beat a junior out for the varsity spot. And, um, at 14 going up against mainly juniors and seniors on varsity, I, they're like 16, 17, 18 years old. My technique was good. Cause I'd been wrestling for a long time, but my strength wasn't where it needed to be. So I wrote an email to a gym, a couple of towns over for me, a town called Newton, Massachusetts. And I just said, listen, I'll take the trash out. I'll clean the floors. I'll do whatever you think, anything you need me to do. Just like, let me come and learn from you. 
And I was so blessed because number one, they said, yes, they let me come and learn from them. And I interned with them starting from 14 years old. And also they were incredibly science-based. So from 14 years old, I get thrust into the very science-based fitness industry, learning from some of the titans in the fitness industry, Dan, John, Pavel Tsatsouline, Eric Cressy, Mike Robertson, Joel Jamieson, uh, some of the most amazing, amazing, amazing names in strength and conditioning and, and fitness for, uh, for, for since time immemorial. And um, so that's when I got started and I was obsessed ever since. I knew that's all I wanted to do. My first ever client was when I was 16. So I started interning at this gym when I was 14. And I started teaching group classes and doing things over the first couple of years, but they didn't give me my first one-on-one -on -one client until I was 16. And his name was Fred. He was uh, like 68 years old. And his only goal was to be able to pick up his grandson without his shoulders hurting. He had rotator cuff issues. And wh when I was like 16 at this point, my whole my goals were always like look good naked and be a good wrestler. That's all I cared about because I was a teenager and that's all I thought about. So for my first client to say like I don't care if I have a six pack, I don't care. Like I just want to be able to pick up my grandson without hurting myself. In that moment, that's when I knew this is really what I wanted to do because I got more excited to help Fred achieve his goals than I was about me achieving my goals. And I spent so much time learning about the shoulder, learning, understanding the shoulder complex, understanding the joint, understanding the movement, how to improve it, just so I could help Fred with his shoulder problems and be able to pick up his grandson. And that's what I've been doing ever since, man. I've just been a strength coach, nutrition coach, fitness coach since I was 14 years old. And I'm 32 now, and I, I'm just as in love with it today as I was then. It's kind of crazy, dude, because at 32 years old, you have lived a lifetime of, of, of adventure, it seems like. I mean, just, you're, you're just crushing it at such a, a young age. Now, so I got to ask, um, the whole deal with Gary Vaynerchuk, I mean, yep. the, and I know serendipity usually plays a role in almost everybody's lives, but I, I just, I can't even fathom how did that come how did he find you did you try to did you seek him out and and then somehow jordan if because because you are so prevalent in the social media space i mean i gotta believe that you have looked that's a big way you have built your business right um did was were you on your way to doing that before gary after was he a mentor kind of how did that relationship begin yeah so the way that worked is I started making content in July of 2011. So that's a little over 12 years ago now. And Gary was a huge uh, influence of mine. I read his books. I was a, I was a follower of his. I, I, I was obsessed with him. And I started making content. I made my first website from my dorm room at University of Delaware. And I just, I didn't know an online business was possible. I just knew I wanted to start writing articles to, to help people. And so I started writing articles at least one a week, every single week uh, in July of 2011, usually more than one a week, but it was at least once a week. Started posting on Facebook, all this stuff. Um, I wrote an article in 2012 that to this day is one of my least popular, least read articles ever. It was, a, it was like three ways to improve your posture if you sit at the desk all day. And I thought it was a great article, but very few people ever read it. But there was one guy who read it. And again, this is in 2012 that I wrote this article. One guy read it. And at this point, um, I'm writing articles for a little over a year now. And very few people are reading my website. Like I get like 20 to 40 views a day, most of which are my mom. And, and so very few people are reading it, even after over a year of writing. But so, so if someone left a comment, I would get super excited and I would go out of my way to answer and reply. One guy left a comment. I didn't know who he was. I knew nothing about him. He, he asked a question, I replied in depth, and that was that. The, without spending too much time, the long story is the guy who left that comment on that article was uh, an accountant in Chicago, and his name was Mike. I didn't know him. I knew nothing about him. We didn't know each other. He just happened to find my website. After that, he decided he wanted to become a personal trainer. So he left his job in Chicago, moved to New York City for an internship, a fitness internship there. Through that internship, he ended up meeting Gary Vaynerchuk, and Mike ended up becoming Gary Vaynerchuk's first personal trainer. He had a two-year deal with Gary. So now we're at uh, about 2015. And I've been writing articles. I've been getting, I've got on Instagram at this point. I'm making, so I'm got on YouTube now. Like I'm starting to build an online business. Um, and I actually moved to Israel because my, my business was online at this point. So I was living in Israel. 
I was just like chilling. I was living my best life. I was, I was, I was coaching people online. Everything was online. And all of a sudden I get, uh, basically, a, a, a call from this guy, Mike being like, Hey, and I don't know, this is the same Mike from this article in 2012. I have no clue. We haven't kept in touch. And basically he, he says, how would you like to coach Gary Vaynerchuk? And I thought it was bullshit. I was like, there's no way, like, there's no way I'm going to like, this guy is for real. Who is this guy? And it turns out he's Gary Vaynerchuk's current coach. He had a two year deal. And once their two years was up, Gary said, uh, do you want to keep coaching me? And like you alluded to coaching Gary is you, you don't get sleep. It's insanely busy. It's nonstop. And Mike said, I think I've had enough. So, uh, he was looking for a new coach and Gary had a lot of postural problems. He had a lot of pain issues. So Mike said, I think I know a guy. Uh, and so Mike reached out to me. He had continued to follow me over the years since I replied to his comment and offered me that opportunity to interview with Gary. So I flew from Tel Aviv to New York. I coached Gary for an hour, flew back to Tel Aviv. Uh, this is in March of 2016 now. And, and I don't hear anything for six weeks. So I believe it was the first or second week of April, 2016. I get a text message from an unknown number. I'm at my family's house in Haifa, the North of Israel. And, uh, the text just says, are you ready? Now, keep in mind, I went to coach Gary for that hour in March. I haven't heard anything since I assumed I didn't get the job. So I just reply and I say, who the fuck is this? Cause I have no idea who it is. And I get a text message, uh, from that same number, a shirtless picture of Gary flexing. And, and that's how I found out I got the job. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, Gary. I had no idea that was you. Da, da, da. And he didn't even reply. And then I moved to New York City a week later and I coached him every single day for three years straight from June 1st, 2016 to June 1st, 2019. Wherever Gary was, I was, um, whether it was Hong Kong, Los Angeles, Amsterdam, New York City, Nashville, Tennessee, all over the world, all like all over. Uh, we traveled more than we were in New York, but it was devastatingly difficult for three years, but it was worth it. And and Gary, it's funny when people ask, like, did I learn about social media? The the most thing that I learned, the most that I learned about social media from Gary was that you just got to make a lot of really good content. There were no hacks. There wasn't like, all right, these are the hashtags you use, or these are the types of content you make. It was just post more and make it really good. And going back to your original question, how did I get that opportunity? It really stems from an article I wrote in 2012 that no one, very few people liked, very few people read. I just ended up replying to the right comment at the right time from the right person and because I was trying to do the right thing. And I continued to build my audience and build my social media so that guy could continue to follow me. So Gary's whole thesis of make content over and over and over again, you never know which piece of content is going to change your life forever is how I got the job coaching Gary. So I think that's a, it's an incredible point because one of the things that I try to tell people is you've just got to put yourself in the arena before anybody's ever going to see you. Right. And so talk to, if you, if the, I don't care if it is another accountant out there that's trying to grow their business and they think maybe social media is the way, or it's another trainer that these two, that, so there's some other random accountant out there and some, some up and coming trainer, how they get together. How important has it been for you to just exercise that, that self-discipline of, I'm going to write the article, even when I don't want to write the article, I'm going to, mm -hmm. even if I have nothing at the top of my mind, I'm going to find something to write about. I'm just going to keep putting it out and putting it out. And then it sounds to me like you already obviously had that mindset, Jordan, before you ever met Gary to begin with, just, I got to just be out there. So mm -hmm. for someone that's that right now, let's say you're coaching someone on, I want to, I'm not just wanting to be a fashion blogger and I don't need the fame and celebrity, but I truly have a business and I want to leverage the power of social media to get my message out there and attract the type of people that I want to interact with. What do you say to that person? Yeah, it's a great question. For me, the, I was very blessed and I've been consistently blessed in so many ways, but when I started my website and I started posting online, it was in July of 2011, and this is before Instagram existed, and it was before I knew an online business was possible. The reason I wanted to make these, the, the website and write articles was because I wanted to help people, and I was super passionate about what I was doing. And that, for me, I think is the, my, one of my greatest blessings because if I got into the online space from the beginning thinking, oh, I'm going to get rich from this, or I should be making money from this, I think I would have gotten 
uh, discouraged very early on because for the first two years, very few people saw my stuff. I didn't make any money for the first two years. Like I didn't get clients. I had no idea it was possible. I was doing it because I loved it. And I was writing articles every week because I enjoyed the process of writing articles. I enjoyed the process of learning. I enjoyed getting better and learning more from doing it. So I think the the major thing here is I didn't get into this to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money. Like making money allows you to be more generous. It, it allows you to, I think, in many ways, impact more people, give more to charity, there, support your family, support your friends. There's so many wonderful things about it. But from what I've seen and from my own experience, whenever my focus has been post to make more money, my anxiety goes up and the enjoyment for the process goes down. But when my goal is post to help people because I enjoy doing this, then I also make more money, I enjoy it more, and my anxiety goes down. So it, it, for me, it's I'm just going to post all the time because I love doing it. Uh, and, and even right now, like uh, as, you, as you can see with everything going on in Israel, and obviously I, have a, I, I lived in Israel, I have family in Israel, like I'm still posting. Even with all the crazy stuff in the world that's going on there right now, I'm still posting because it's what I love to do. Like this, this is what I love. So um, that for me is the, the number one thing. And, and as long as you're consistent, you keep posting. Same thing with fitness. It's like, listen, if you really want to lose fat, like get your nutrition in check, make sure you're getting your steps in, make sure you're getting your sleep. It's the boring stuff that you do over and over and over and over again. That's really going to have the biggest difference. It's not what supplements you take. It's, it's not like the getting in the ice bath that's going to make the biggest difference in your fat loss journey. It's, it's going to be, are you eating right? Are you sleeping well? Are you getting your protein, getting your fiber? Are you, are you getting your workouts in? Like, that's it. That's, that's the 98% of it. The rest, like the extra 2%, like it's small minutia that won't have that big of a difference. Uh, it won't make a difference at all if you're not doing the big blocks. So do it because you love it. And, uh, and I think from that perspective or from that point, if, as long as you're doing it because you love it, the, the good things will come to you and to the people you're trying to help. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of how my podcast took a turn. I, it started out as a business podcast when it was the Texas Titan podcast for the first two years that I had this show. And I just got bored with business, to be honest with you. I mean, I have an entrepreneurial background. I bought and sold businesses. And um, that was, that's part of my identity. But where I got really passionate was not only getting myself optimized and, and as re re with regard to health, you know, trying to my best to just, when I found the joy of being really healthy, and, mm -hmm. and just the, the natural high you can give yourself whenever you understand how to tap into those neurochemicals. And, 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 and then just when it started, I got older and I wanted to, you know, like, it's interesting that you mentioned that Fred wanted to be able to pick up his grandkids and not without his shoulders hurting, because that's one of the things that Peter Atia talks about all the time, whenever he's mm -hmm. getting ready for his, right, for his octogenarian or not octogenarian, but his uh, centenarian decathlon is one of the metrics is to be able to pick up my kid, you know, whenever I'm old or my grandkids. And so. That is a perfect segue, which you just said about your passion about fitness and helping people to get into what I like about your content as it relates to health and wellness, because it's one of the things that I try to convey to people that they think that everyone has to go out and be a Tim Kennedy, like we mentioned earlier, or, or they have to just, you know, be Jocko or, and, and try to look like Greg Avedon when essentially, if you just get your ass off the couch, just start walking, just start moving. And that's what I love about your content. As a matter of fact, um, I want to go. I'm going to show a little bit of your content here in a minute because I think the way you put your 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 spin on it, but it always comes down to simplicity and taking care of the basics. And so, so for that listener out there, that's like I'm I'm 48, and they just they they want to just live longer, be able to move. Kind of what are some of the benchmarks they should be looking for? What are some things that they need to be doing? I don't even want to say every day, every week, but just on a regular basis, if they wanted to take up training, but they're scared to death about mm -hmm. subscribing to Syat Fitness or going to a gym, but they, they, but they know they need to get something in order. Where do you start that person on their fitness journey, man? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's funny. It's going to sound so simple. People are going to be like, there's no way that it works, but it's the truth. Um, and the reality is what I'm going to say, there's nothing to sell. This is just fact. Like there's no program to sell. This is just, this is the truth. Um, it's not, <laughs> it's not a fancy supplement. It's not a, an expensive tool. It's just everything that you can do directly from your home. So number one, and, and I battled with this for years, like what's the number one most important thing? 
I used to start with nutrition and I realized the reason I, I've moved away from nutrition, not because it's not important. Nutrition is, is unbelievably important. But what I'm talking about, the most important thing that you, anyone can do from the very beginning, the reason I switched from nutrition is because if we look at the longest living populations in the world, we've got Okinawa on that list. We've got uh, Italy on that list. We've got uh, Switzerland on that list, like top 10 longest living populations in the world. Each of these populations has radically different dietary protocols, whether it's Okinawa, Japan, whether it's Italy, whether it's Switzerland, very different, very different focuses and emphasis. And what's important to recognize about that is that what it shows is that you can eat a variety of different foods and still be very healthy and live a very long life as long as your total calorie in check, total calories are in check and you're still uh, eating the, the right amount, your body fat levels are in check, you have enough, enough muscle, lean mass. So nutrition, I, I put second because I think the first thing that someone should start with is walking. And the reality is when we look at populations across the world, the longest living populations, the ones like I just said, and many, many more, the most common denominator is walking. It's, it's activity. Uh, we see people who walk the most are the healthiest and they live the longest. And there's no debating that. It's funny also, like I come from a powerlifting background, a wrestling background, jujitsu background. Uh, I've been an athlete my whole life. But if there was only one exercise that I could choose for the rest of my life, it would be walking because it, it's without question the most important from a longevity perspective. Obviously, strength training is incredibly important as well. Obviously, there, there are super important benefits to mobility as well. But there's no question that walking has the greatest impact on, on long-term health. With, there's, just, there's no debating it just based on all the research that we have and across a number of populations, whether it's in controlled trials, epidemiological research, they all point to walking being number one. And the great part is that the vast majority of people can do it. You don't need to go to a gym for it. You don't need extra money to do it. Uh, as long as you can stand on your two feet, you can go on a walk. And if you can't walk for whatever reason, you can bike, you can swim, you can row. It's, it's movement. The reason I say walking is because that's the, what's measured. It's a very easy thing to measure in studies and across populations. But if someone has an issue where they can't actually walk, it's just movement. It's daily movement in whatever capacity that means. It's one of the reasons why, like, and I have nothing against ice baths, like they're fine, but it's funny, like I see a lot of people promoting the ice baths. And again, it's fine if you want to do it. But if we're looking at health, from a health perspective, what's better, sitting in an ice bath for three minutes or going on a walk? Like walking is like, number one, it, it's way more comfortable. It's in a lot of people are buying these $20,000 ice bath things. It's like, if you want to, great, but you're going to get way more health benefits from just getting the fuck up and moving and going on a walk. Um, and I love sauna, a huge fan of saunas. And I, like, I'll, I'll do an ice bath here and there, but it's, it's funny for me. The reason ice baths have made such a big, uh, a splash, for, no pun intended, is because um, people want to go viral. People want their content to go nuts. And so when they post about this crazy, difficult thing, people are more likely to watch. People don't want to watch someone go on a fucking walk. Is it not exciting? So people will find things in order to go viral and then they will make more content around it. Walking is number one without question. Number two, then we can get into nutrition. And then I think the two major, th uh, three major things were nutrition. Number one is your total calories need to be in check. Total calories are going to dictate how much body fat you have. Uh, once that's like, once your body fat is in check and that's at a healthy level, that's going to diminish your risk of so many issues. Uh, it's going to increase, improve your health dramatically, not just your physical health, but mental, emotional health as well. There, like, there's a huge group of people saying body fat doesn't matter and they're fucking liars and, and they blinded themselves. Body fat is, is the greatest predictor of long term health. So, nutri and nutrition is the number one thing you can do to improve that. So, keep your calories in check, number one. And then I would say two and three, which are tied, is protein and fiber. You want to make sure you're getting enough protein every day and you want to make sure you're getting enough fiber every day. I think for those of us like you and me who are very interested in nutrition, most of the people nowadays have really increased their protein intake. We can see it across marketing. We can see it uh, like you go into a 7-Eleven, a CVS, a Walgreens, you can see all these protein rich supplements now, all these, like, all these foods have like high protein options. Protein, thank goodness, has really become a, a major emphasis across our, at least the United States. It's not the same across other countries. It's become huge. What has fallen by the wayside is fiber. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this, but it's very dangerous that, that people are not getting enough fiber there. I guarantee you, I, I've, uh, unfortunately I have some friends who are, um, are experts in, in colon health, 
in, in prostate health and, and specifically in relation, relation to cancer. And one of the major things that they're seeing, and, and we, I don't know if you've heard of it, but what we're seeing is people are, men are being asked to get their colonoscopies earlier and earlier Absolutely. and earlier, get their prostates checked earlier and earlier and earlier because the rates of cancer are rising. And what my colleagues and, and friends who are in the, the cancer realm of, of those specific topics are saying is largely due to decreased fiber intake. And so we need to make sure people are getting their calories in check, protein and fiber, not one or either. It's like, it's all of those. Those are the three most important things. And if we combine walking with those three, like you're pretty good. You know, one of the things too, Jordan, that um, I read a study a while back where they took these, um, they were hotel housekeepers, uh, most of which when they asked, did they get enough uh, daily or weekly, whatever it was, exercise, and most of them all said no. And then they, they, they kind of, they told them that, well, they, they educated these housekeepers on the fact that most of the work that they were doing met the actual uh, yes. metrics for getting enough. And just by them t understanding that, oh, so I'm actually getting exercise in my job, markers on their, their health and their blood work changed dramatically in ways that just didn't even make sense. They couldn't really explain it other than they now looked at their job as getting some exercise. And so that's what I always love to tell people. Like, for example, me, I, I probably right now, uh, I don't know if you've seen on Instagram, but I'm doing this eight weeks to seal fit Mark Devine's yes. program. Yeah, yeah. Just for the pure hell of it, I'm not going to seal fit. I'm sure as hell not going to buds. <laughs> but, but I'm like, you know, I wanted to. I I, I, I really like uh, uh to to program everything, and so I, I do a Ben Greenfield thing that I that's my yeah. that's just kind of my standard. And then, but like this morning because I've been going at it, you know, I do two, I, I work out twice a day, morning and afternoon, every day. A lot of cardio in there, as it makes sense. And today I just said, you know what, screw it. My morning workout is not going to be one of the normal workouts. It's going to be a four mile walk. And in my mind, that was my workout. It's not just, I'm not working out. I'm walking instead. And that's the thing too, that a lot of people need to understand. Now, talking about nutrition, because I think this is so important, fiber and protein. So to that listener that's out there, they just heard this and they're like, okay, Jordan, I, I, I believe you, you know, J Jason, Jason trusts you. So I trust you. Where do they get the protein and the fiber? Where's the best place to get that? Yeah. So, um, I'll start with protein. It's so, so simple. And again, like, thank God there, there's been a huge surge, uh, uh, huge surge of people promoting more protein. So any, any, it's so, it's so simple, chicken, turkey, uh, any type of fish, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, eggs, steak, uh, these are all amazing sources of protein. Uh, if anyone happens to be uh, plant-based, vegan, whatever, uh, tempeh, tofu, seitan, beans, these are also great sources as well. Um, but generally, I prefer the whole food options, the ones that I first, li first listed, uh, chicken, turkey, fish, uh, eggs, steak, these are all amazing, amazing options. Greek yogurt, cottage cheese are the things that I have every day as well. Um, so protein is relatively easy. And if you want to have protein powders, they're great. Like I, I have protein powders as well. Usually one or two scoops a day. It's just quick, easy, convenient, and it tastes pretty good. And sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, I haven't ate my protein yet. And I don't want to have a fucking chicken breast. So I'll have a protein, a scoop of protein. It's not, um, unique. It's not magical. It's just a convenient way of getting protein in. So that's protein. Fiber is also very, very simple, but very, people don't know as much about it yet. Uh, which is ironic just because fiber is, is so important for health. Um, but it's, it's hard to, to market fiber. Protein is easily marketable yeah. because, you know, build more muscle, burn more fat. Like there's so many supplements that come with protein fiber. Uh, it's like Metamucil and all. It's like, it's not really more marketable, but I would rather not get it from something like Metamucil. Generally, the health benefits are not as, as clear from that. that. That's actually an interesting difference that I don't think I've spoken about very much is the protein supplements. There are like, you can get the same benefits from pr protein powder as you do from chicken, for example. You essentially get the same benefits, all the same amino acids, the same like similar amino acid profiles. You get the same spike in, in protein synthesis. So protein powder and protein from whole food, you get the same, essentially the same benefits. There are differences in terms of satiation levels, how full you're getting, uh, but generally the same physiological benefits. Fiber is not the same. The fiber you get from whole foods is not the same as something you get from something like Metamucil. Um, so what I would say is the, the, what most people will 
tout as the best sources of fiber are vegetables. And there are some amazing vegetables that are higher in fiber. But actually, the for me, like some of the, the best sources of fiber are blackberries and raspberries, which have a huge amount of fiber. They have the most fiber out of any fruit. Um, avocado has a surprising amount of fiber. So blackberries, raspberries, avocado, all super high in fiber. Um, I would say it, any beans, beans are, and lentils are very high in fiber. Uh, if we look at, again, longest living societies, lentil, uh, societies that eat lentils are generally far healthier. Um, uh, we can look at, yes, other vegetables as well. Pumpkin seeds or really any seed, uh, beans, nuts, and seeds are relatively high in fiber. Pumpkin seeds have a ton of fiber. Navy beans have a lot of fiber. Uh, one of my favorite cereals, it's called Bran Buds. It usually is recommended to like 75 year old men, but like it's actually a ridiculously high fiber cereal. And every morning, what I'll do is I'll have my Bran Buds, I'll have a cup of Bran Buds with blackberries and raspberries, and then some Greek yogurt, some Oikos high protein Greek yogurt. I call it my fiber bomb. It's got like over 20 grams of fiber. It's got over 30 grams of protein. And like, I'm set. And, and if we're looking at recommendations for how much uh, fiber you should have, the general recommendation is women should shoot for at least 25 grams of fiber a day. Men should shoot for at least 38 grams of fiber a day. If you want to individualize it more and not make, make it off gender, uh, generally speaking, about 14 grams of fiber for, one that, for every 1,000 calories that you eat. So if you're having 2,000 calories, that would be about 28 grams of fiber per day. And I mean, realistically, like my breakfast has like more, way more than half of my daily fiber intake just in my breakfast and cereal, uh, cereal, Greek yogurt and, and berries. And it's delicious. It, it tastes great. And it's, it's very nutritious as well. So once you start prioritizing fiber and protein, you get more full, you get more nutrition and fat loss becomes easier and health becomes more easier, more easy. And I guess for protein, I think the uh, FDA or whoever determines that, they say 0.8 grams of protein per, per pound of body weight. But would you say go a little higher than that? Or is that pretty accurate? What, what are your thoughts on protein? Yeah, so th it's actually that if we're talking about uh, 0.7 grams per pound of lean body mass, then I agree with that as a minimum. If they're doing it per grams per kilogram, I, I'm not a huge fan. I think that they need okay. to, to increase that. Um, so generally speaking, the minimum I like to shoot for is 0.7 grams per pound of lean body mass. Now, um, an easy way to estimate your lean body mass, because a lot of people don't, they hear that and they're like, I don't know what the fuck that means. I don't know how to do that. Very simple. You, you, what is generally your goal weight? Like, where do you think you would be your leanest? Like where, like, where would you be if you were at your leanest body weight? That is about a very good estimate of your lean body mass. So like if someone is 200 pounds and they think they'd be their leanest around 170, then like that's about your lean body mass. Uh, usually people will be like, I think I'd be my leanest at 170. They'd actually be their leanest closer to like 155, 160. So like their lean body mass is a little bit less than what they would like, but it's a good estimate to begin with. What I've found is people who are very into fitness like you and me, uh, but especially as we get more towards the bodybuilder realm, they often are overeating protein to the point where it can be detrimental and they're, they're neglecting fiber. People who are not as much into fitness like you and me, they're under eating protein and also under eating fiber. So early on, I actually like to recommend going a little bit higher to about one gram per pound of lean body mass because I like the behavioral aspect of let's try and get more so you can learn what it means to prioritize protein. From a physiological perspective, as long as you're getting 0.7 grams per pound of lean body mass, you're essentially maxing out the benefits from a fat loss and muscle gain perspective. But the behaviorally, it's important to understand what it means to prioritize protein. And for people who've been prioritizing carbs and fats and not protein, it's very important to make that switch early on. So starting off with one gram per pound of lean body mass, but knowing that 0.7 is that, that threshold you need to hit. Look, makes a lot of sense. And then that brings us into something. Okay, so I want to take the viewer or the listener, however they're consuming this, on a little, I want to show them some of your handiwork. And I actually had this pulled up earlier, so I was a little more professional with this. But I loved your uh, most recent uh, deal you did with regard to glucose. Because oh, 
yeah, no, it was awesome about 30 days of spiking your sugar right here. So, all right. So before we even start this, Jordan, what I want to ask you is kind of what led you to do this experiment on yourself with regard to spiking your blood sugar and having sugar? Kind of what was the, the premise of this? Yeah. So as, as, as are you, I'm a huge fan of Peter Atiyah, uh, and he's really exploded over the last, I would say, couple of years. And rightfully so. I think he's been doing an amazing job. Uh, one of the things that he's been been talking about is continuous glucose monitors. Now, I don't know him personally. I would love to get to know him. But this is one of the things that I don't agree with him on in terms of everybody needing to monitor their glucose. I don't, and I, I don't want to say this from the perspective, I don't know him, I've never spoken to him, but a lot of people are pushing these CGMs because they're getting an affiliate payment on the back end or they own a company about it. Uh, and, and it's it's generating an outrageous amount of it, like truly remarkable amounts of income. Now, what's going on is, what, and I'm sure you've seen it on, on social media, is people are taking their CGMs, their continuous glucose monitors, healthy people, not diabetics, are being like, hey, look, I'm going to have oatmeal. And look how high my blood sugar spiked from having oatmeal. Oatmeal must be bad. Don't eat oatmeal. And I'm like, are you fucking stupid? What you just saw was your body's healthy response to eating oatmeal. That means your body is working properly. If what you saw was something different, it, number one, if your blood sugar didn't spike from eating oatmeal, that would be a problem. If your blood sugar stayed chronically elevated for hours after eating oatmeal, that would be a problem. But you saw a quick spike up and a quick, spike, a quick drop back down. Congratulations, you're not diabetic. You're very healthy. That's what's supposed to happen. And people have equated these blood sugar spikes with something is bad, so you shouldn't eat it. Now, there are so many issues with this, but it's creating a lot of fear around food. And I've seen people do this with fruit. You, you know, what's really funny is the number one thing over 30 days that spiked my blood sugar the most, more than, like, listen, I ate a cup of pure raw sugar. Uh, I ate gummy worms for breakfast. I had Skittles. I, like, I had everything. The thing that spiked my blood sugar the most out of everything was watermelon. Wow. Watermelon had the greatest spike. Now, watermelon has 140 calories per pound of watermelon. How many people who are obese do you know who said, yeah, it was really the watermelon that got me this way? Right, right. No one. Watermelon is one of the healthiest things you can have. And when you break down and you look at this one individual physiological response, you can't then extrapolate and just say, well, a food is good or bad for you because that's going to prevent fat loss. So I wanted to do this because people are scared of eating fruit because of the blood sugar response. People are scared of having oatmeal. People are scared of, of having a, a, a slice of cake at their daughter's birthday party. It's like these foods are, are, you shouldn't be having cake every day in the huge quantities, but to fear a blood sugar spike, it, the, the, and I don't know if people are going to know this, but we could use the same uh, example for blood pressure. High blood pressure is, is known as the silent killer. High blood pressure kills hundreds of thousands of Americans every year. And the reason it's called the silent killer is because you don't know you have it. There's no signs or symptoms of it. It's just you might have high blood pressure and then you get a heart attack, a stroke, whatever it is, and you die. And it doesn't matter your race, your gender, your age, like it can happen to anybody. Now, what people, what often people don't understand is that when you exercise, your blood pressure goes up. It's a normal physiological response to exercise. Your blood pressure increases. No one would say, oh, exercise is bad because your blood pressure goes up, because we know over the long term, exercise improves your blood pressure. It's not that one individual response to exercise, it's what, what happens over the long term. Same thing with blood sugar. When, when you are increasing your blood sugar in one individual spike, like that's normal from a meal, but over the long term, what's happening if your calories and protein and fiber are in check, it's gonna improve your blood sugar response as long as your body fat is staying in a healthy range. So it's not about blood sugar spikes individually. It's about what's your diet like as a whole and what's your body fat like and your lifestyle like. Another thing people don't understand is that high intensity exercise spikes your blood sugar. So what I find comical is that people will say like, oh, well, you shouldn't spike your blood sugar and you should also do high intensity training. I'm like, well, <laughs> high intensity training is going to spike your blood sugar. So is that bad? Of course not. It's so good for you. So I just wanted to show people that you can enjoy your favorite foods and you can spike your blood sugar and still be very healthy and lose fat. And that's what I did at the end of 30 days. I love it. And I want to show just a little bit of that video because it was so well done. I'm just going to show kind of the intro, just kind of a recap basically.
And I won't take everybody through that conversation, but it, uh, the, to me, the way you, the, I, I liked the, the whole video and what you did there because you and, um, Lane Norton, I think better than anybody you, I don't want to say you bust myths, but what you do is you take these things that people do freak out about and, 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 and are so polarized on like zero carbs or die, you know, zero sugar or die, or, you know, or, you know, metformin or you're going to die young, <laughs> you know, whatever. And you guys will kind of like, you know, call bullshit on it. Lane takes the perspective of, you know, going through the actual studies and showing, yeah, you're, you're cherry picking data and he'll say, but did you look at the rest of the, the, the report you, I mean, you use yourself as a human guinea pig. And I mean, one of the things we talked about in, uh, in Franklin, Tennessee was, and, and I, if you want to say the brand, you can say the brand, but there's a particular, very expensive green powder drink that you kind of like you, you poked out a little bit because people get to that. My, it's kind of, you know, it's like Jordan, it's like, Okay, if if it's not a workout, why even do it? Kind of like walking. And what you do is you help people realize, okay, if it's not the premium brand that Tim Ferriss is chugging, you know, for the last 12 years, then why even try? And I love that. And so I think people need to hear that, that you don't have to be so dogmatic about one thing or the other. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about your content. Thank you, man. I appreciate that a lot. And I'm a huge fan of Lane as well. And, and he's a friend of mine. He's He's incredible. He's, he's one of the, he, I mean, he's, the thing is, that's unusual about guys like Lane is that he's so, he's got such a freaking giant brain and yeah. he's a bro. I mean, the dude loves to move massive quantities of weight. I love just watching his videos when he's in a competition, his little, uh, pregame prep, yeah. you know, walking <laughs> to the bar. He does it better than anybody, but he's just, he, he's so freaking smart, but you can tell the thing is that what you guys do is you're not trying to play contrarian for the contrarian's sake. You're trying to let. And I'm speaking for you, but this is what I gather is you're trying to give people hope. You're trying to give pe mm. that, that normal everyday person that isn't like you and I, and frankly, doesn't have either by, by vocation for the business you built or me just by God's grace that, yeah, we get to play with all the toys and we get to work out anytime we want. We get to do these things. I want those people to realize that just because I do it like this doesn't mean that you can't t do a third of it and really move the needle. And I think that's really kind of what you guys are doing. Is that if I got it right? Dude, a hundred percent. It's if we look at, so my background is in behavioral psychology from a mm. higher education perspective. So I look at everything from behavior. Um, and I look at like when I, so I started obviously when I, like I told you when I was 14, getting into uh, the industry. And initially when I went to university, I thought I was going to go in for exercise science. But by the time I got in for exercise science, I realized that my professors had never actually coached anybody. And they were all like talking for, about research that was many, many years old and that they hadn't kept up to date with the research because they were tenured professors. They had no incentive to. And the other thing I realized was I could give someone the perfect program, the most ideal picture, perfect workout, nutrition plan, all of it. But if they don't follow it, it means nothing. So I switched to behavioral health psychology because I wanted to understand why are people making the decisions they're making? Like everybody knows that like Apple donut which one's the better choice for their health and fat loss. Everyone knows Apple's the better choice. You don't need a degree to understand that. Um, for, I mean, we can even look at cigarettes, right? Like on the box of cigarettes, there's a skull and crossbone and it says, this is going to kill you, literally. And not only do people who are currently addicted to them still buy them, but people like today, right now, someone is buying their first ever box of cigarettes, even knowing that it's going to kill them. And so we've got to ask, like, why? Why are people making these decisions? And it doesn't just come down to knowledge. It doesn't just come down to what you know. There are other uh, factors at play. And that's what's always interested me is, like, behaviorally, psycho psychologically, what? So my content and my, my delivery and everything that I do, everything that I say, the way that I phrase it, is all done from the perspective of, I want you to feel confident knowing that you can do this. The term for this in, in psychology is, is called self-efficacy which is uh, it's similar to self-confidence. It's not exactly the same. But if we look at people uh, who are successful in life, it, whether it's fitness, nutrition, business, relationships, people who are successful generally have a very high level of self-efficacy in which they believe in their ability to succeed. Whereas people who don't believe in themselves, they don't succeed because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why would they even try if they don't believe it's going to work? So my entire goal is to help people believe, oh no, you can do this. 
you can succeed. It's not as complicated as the marketers are making you believe. You can absolutely do this. Maybe not, maybe you can't be an end. Like I'll never be in the NBA. I'm five foot four. Like it's never going to happen. So like, I don't work as hard as I could on basketball, but like I could get better. I could improve. And I, I don't want people to be, my goal isn't to get people to be in the NBA or be an elite athlete or Olympian. My goal is to get people to live longer and be able to enjoy life with a higher quality of life with their friends and family. And the more people believe they can do that, the better. I love it, brother. I love that mission. So let's just, I want to talk about just real quick before we wrap up, because I know your time is precious. What does a day in the life of Jordan Syatt look like at this point? Man, so it's changed pretty radically recently just because not only have we had our daughter, but we just moved. So in a little bit of a transition phase, but generally I'll give you the the schedule right before we moved like a week ago. Um, wake up usually around 6 a.m. Um, I like to to pray every morning. So I, I'm Jewish and I wrap to fill in every morning. So uh, I, I like to do that. And I like to read my, like either the, the Bible or the Talmud. Uh, so I get like my prayers in, coffee in early in the morning. And uh, then from there, I spend time, have breakfast with my family, with my wife and with my daughter, play around, go to jujitsu. Um, and then I usually do jujitsu from like nine to 10 or 10 to 11, somewhere in that range. And then after that, I'll work for about anywhere between like four to six hours. So that four to six hour range for me is what I do now. It's not what I did when I first started. I used to work like 16 hour days, 17, 18 hour days. It was nonstop. Now I have much more work-life balance, but then I'll work for four to six hours. After that, hang out with my wife and daughter. Um, I will usually try and get uh, a walk-in. So usually at night, at like six or seven o'clock, my wife, daughter, and I will all go on a, on a walk, several mile walk, um, and then come back and, that, and that's it. Then I'll have a glass of wine with my wife, put our daughter down and, and repeat. And whenever you started building your business, because I mean, you're, you've got a, a pretty, a healthy enterprise at this point, both from your media standpoint and your, your fitness business, how big is your team? And when did you start having to expand that? Cause I know that's one of the things, and, and just real quick, Jordan. So a lot of this show is based on entrepreneurship. We talk a lot about entrepreneurship on the show and I'm always trying to help that would be entrepreneur out there. That's trying to scale a business, start a business. And, and that's one of the toughest questions is like you, you starting out as an independent trainer. Well, that's, you get clients, you get a book of business and you train them, but now you're so much bigger than that. How have you managed that transition from being a personal trainer to personality? You're still doing the health and nutrition and how big's your team and how do you manage all of that? Yeah, it's a great question. It was very difficult for me. Um, it's funny. Like when people ask what I do, I still like, if someone doesn't know who I am, I just say I'm a personal trainer. Um, I, I've never really like the, I, I don't, I don't like the influencer culture. I don't like the, oh, like I'm, I'm an online influencer. Like it's like, I'm a personal trainer and I love what I do. Um, because of that, I've never wanted a huge team. I never wanted to be a manager of people. I just want to work with people and coach people and help people. So I was very resistant to expanding my team early on. Uh, and I still am to a degree. I just, I like a small team of people because I don't like drama. I don't like being a manager. I, I just like doing what I do and, and having a small people that I trust, a group of people that I trust. So the, my first hire was my, was my assistant. And that was in 2016, I believe. Um, and it got to a point where I had a huge roster of online coaching clients. I was doing my, my one-on-ones. I was doing my membership, uh, all of my content, emails. I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I actually took on a previous client as my assistant. And it was very difficult because I was micromanaging anything. The first thing I told her, I was like, I don't trust you looking at my, doing my emails. So the only thing you're allowed to do is just take out the spam emails, like go through my email. If there's any spam, you can delete it. But that was it for like a year. And eventually she was like, you need to let me do more. Like you need to let go a little bit. And so she's been amazing. She's, I've had her ever since, but the, from a fitness perspective, a lot of coaches, what they'll do is once they can start hiring is they'll hire other coaches and then they give clients to that coach, which there's nothing wrong with that inherently, but I knew that I didn't want to run an operation in which I had other coaches beneath me for a number of reasons. Number one is because I am now responsible for what that coach does. It's all under my name, which I don't like that because I can't, I can't control what they do. And also the fitness industry is notorious for other coaches coming on, taking your clients and then leaving. And I was like, fuck that. I don't want to do that. Hmm. So my uh, route was I'll take on an assistant to help me handle more and then from there, I wanted to grow my, my membership, which is much more scalable than one-on-one coaching. So I don't do one-on-one coaching anymore. Now it's fully the membership. 
And I have one coach who uh, helps me with that. And she helps me with emails. She helps me with in the group setting. She helps me put things together. She helps me stay on track because I, it's very easy for me to get distracted. Uh, so I have my full-time assistant. I have a full-time coach that helps me inside the, the membership group. Uh, the major thing with her, she was also a previous client. Um, she did not want to run her own business, which was one of the major prerequisites is I didn't want someone who in the future wanted to run their own business. I wanted someone to feel like they were a part of my business. So then from there, I have a, a podcast producer. I have an app developer. I have a, a, a website developer. I have a videographer, which is probably the, the other main one who really helps me get more content in. But the, the team, the main team is my assistant and my assistant coach. And then I have these other contractors that I bring in who work uh, very, very closely with me and, and some of them full-time, some of them more independent contractors on, on a part-time basis. But it's a relatively small team. It's like, I don't know, eight people. And um, the, I still do a lot. I, I do all of the content per, from the perspective of no one is hitting publish on YouTube. No one is hitting publish on my podcast. No one is hitting publish on my Instagram except for me. I have a podcast producer who helps come up with ideas <clears throat> and who helps um, edit it. I have, a, pod, I have a, a videographer who helps film and edit. But I have the final say, and I'm the only one interacting and engaging with people on social media. I love it, man. I think that's so, that's so helpful. And isn't it nice these days where you can buy, there's so many freelancers out there. I think that we've gone to, I mean, obviously COVID lent itself to a lot of that, but you can put together a pretty sizable freelance team these days and, and whenever yeah. you once couldn't. One question I want to ask you before we go, and then make sure that I do not let you go without letting everyone know how to sign up for your app and how to get in touch with you. I want everybody to know that. But before that, what is something that, so way back when, when you were starting, you were back at in University of Delaware or even back whenever you were still in Massachusetts, that you thought about fitness that was religion, you were, and it's, you, you just, you held tightly to it. But now you look at it and you're like, that was the biggest bunch of crap. I've completely shifted gears on. Do you have anything like that? And if so, what, what is something that's completely changed in your mind on fitness, nutrition, or both? Oh man, that my life, everything was, was fitness. Like as hardcore, as strict, as rigid as you, as you could possibly imagine. Um, I started intermittent fasting when I was, was either 16 or 17. And it was at the recommendation of my wrestling coach. And so this was 2006 or 2007. And I read a book by uh, a guy named Ori Hoff Meckler, who was actually in the Israeli Defense Forces. And he started intermittent fasting because that was just easiest for him when he was uh, in the IDF, when he was on, on duty as an active duty uh, military, uh, an active duty military, it was just easier for him to intermittent fast. And I started intermittent fasting religiously, uh, but the, the, it was called the Warrior Diet by Ori Hoffmeckler. And the way he structured it was 20 hours fasting, four hours feeding. And it became, it became my religion. Like you said, that's, it's all I would do. I would not for nothing and for nobody would I break my fast early ever. I was like, this is my fasting window. I am not eating. I'm not doing anything other than I'm fasting. And then I would binge eat, uh, for the remaining four hours of the day. And it actually really screwed me up mentally and emotionally. And it created a lot of disordered eating habits. Um, because I, I was like, I would need to eat as much as I possibly can in this four hour window. But I did that from uh, probably 17 to 21 years old. It, and it was, that was my religion. Now, years later, I've realized that meal frequency is entirely up to the individual. Um, sometimes I do intermittent fast, usually more with a 16 and 8 protocol. Um, but if I intermittent fast, it's just because I'm not hungry for breakfast or because based on my schedule, I know I won't have time or whatever it is. Um, now, the structure with which I eat, the, the frequency with which I eat is entirely built around my schedule and my personal preference. It's not I used to intermittent fast because I was told and then I believed that intermittent fasting would be better for fat loss. I was told and I believed that intermittent fasting was superior for longevity. And now years later, it wasn't, I, I actually looked at the science, I looked at the research and we are, it's very clear that intermittent fasting is not superior. It's just another tool as long as your total calories are in check. So uh, that's just one example in which I was outrageously rigid. Another one was organic foods. I was, I was, uh, you know, I'm Jewish, but I was a Nazi when it came to organic. Like I would only eat organic, which was terrible because my family did not have much money. And I used to give my mom so much grief and 
guilt her a lot for not buying organic. Um, and it wasn't until I actually started studying food sciences and understanding uh, like how that organic world works from a marketing perspective that so much of it, so much of the claims are completely manufactured. Uh, and, and the reality that if you want to buy organic, for example, my wife tends to buy mostly organic, even though I tell her incessantly that she doesn't need to, she just prefers it, which I think is more of a, a placebo and in, in her head. But um, the, the reality is organic is not inherently better. If you like it or if you can afford it and if you want to, great, but it's not inherently safer or healthier for you. It's just another option that is mainly driven by marketing, which um, I love capitalism. I'm a huge fan of capitalism. I think it's amazing. But I think it's one of the drawbacks is that so much of what we see is marketing driven, which can really lead us astray in terms of uh, propaganda can very easily convince us. And there's not as many restrictions as we would think around the the marketing that we that we see because so much of it is just it's allowed, which, uh, again, I think it's better to allow it than to not allow it from if this is a different conversation in a free society and a free market. But a lot of people are very misinformed in regard to what's true and what's not around these types of foods. Absolutely, especially just notorious in the supplement industry and health and wellness in general. You can kind of say whatever you want. It's uh, yeah. it's kind of it's kind of crazy. So yeah. so, <clears throat> all right. Well, with that, how do people find you, follow you, and sign up for the app and start working out with you? Yeah. So thank you so much for for doing that. I really appreciate it, man. Absolutely, what man. I'll say is, do not buy anything from me. Uh, I, I would say first, find me on Instagram, find me on YouTube, find my podcast, Jordan Syatt, S Y A T T. Um, I only have one account on each of those, by the way, and, and they're all verified. So like, if you see any other accounts that are not verified, it's not me, but Instagram, YouTube podcast doesn't have verification as the Jordan site, mini podcast, but listen to my content. If you enjoy it, then you'll be able to learn very quickly where you can sign up with me. But before you don't spend any money on me yet, just listen to my free content and, and I hope you find it helpful. Awesome, brother. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say that I and my family are praying for Israel and you, any brother. family and friends over there, brother, uh, as a Christian, you know, we, our heritage, you know, it's, we're, 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 we're brothers, man. We, yeah. our lineage follows the same place. And so I want you to know that during the time that you're, that, that everybody that we're all going through collectively, but in, in particular, those friends of mine, like you that have friends, family that are over there and then are walking through this and to continue to make the time for not only to continue with what you're doing for your business, to, to keep, to, to keep the, the trains running on time and everything, but to also ha take that time to spend with me, brother. I want you to know, thank you. It means the world to me. And from the bottom of my heart, um, I'm just, I'm with you guys. I'm, I'm praying for you. And um, hopefully all this mess will be sorted out soon. Thank you, man. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. All right, brother. Well, Jordan, this has been awesome. Thank you for making the time. And folks, thanks for listening to The Jason Wright Show.